Montessori is all about the individual. The individual as opposed to the state. The individual as opposed to the idea of a factory where everyone is the same, where everything is standardized. It's really important to understand that Montessori is not a sports car, it's not an opera by Verdi, it's not the new chain of Italian restaurants across your province. Montessori is not a franchise, it's not copyrighted, and it's not preschool, it's not only for the rich. It goes through high school, it's not new, it's 108 years old now. It is worldwide. There's 22,000 plus Montessori schools in 110 countries and counting. China alone is currently building more than 10,000 additional Montessori elementary schools with an enrollment average of about 1,000 students apiece. In the United States, there are more than a million children attending public charter and private Montessori schools. In Canada, I don't know the exact number. My best guess is approximately 300,000, with the largest concentration being in BC and in Ontario. The movement is spreading around the world. After decades and decades of having been forgotten, and it helps to understand a little bit of the history. Maria Montessori was not a teacher. She was a world-famous professor of medicine, one of the world's first brain researchers. She was a colleague of Binet, who developed our modern intelligence test. She was one of the people who was asking the question about what makes us human? Are the rich truly wealthier because they are born with better genes. Are humans inherently violent? Is competition and selfishness hardwired into human nature? What is human nature? Most of the world assumes that the cream rises to the top, that in any population a few, a small percentage, will show themselves as being of superior blood. In its most extreme form, we call this social Darwinism, and in its political manifestation, we typically call it the elitism of the fascist parties. Adolf Hitler championed the idea of breeding of superior genes. Maria Montessori observed, as a woman, more than 100 years ago, that the children of the poor, up until about age six, looked just like the children of the wealthy. That little girls are as capable as little boys. That children of color are just as capable as children of European ancestry. And more importantly than anything else, she discovered what she called the secret of childhood. And that secret is that that child right there, at her stage of life, is more vibrantly alive, more capable of being influenced in a positive or negative way by all of the experiences that come into her world from parents, grandparents, friends, teachers, daycare workers. If you do the right thing, a tiny little bit of input will shape that child's future forever. But you take someone your age, my age, it's not that we can't change. We change every, every day of our lives. But it's not the same. If you flow with the tide of the human brain, learning goes unconsciously. It goes naturally. The closer to birth you are, the more powerful the impact you can have. Montessori schools are not copyrighted. There is no central authority. I don't know who came up with the idea that I am the leading expert on Montessori. 
There are 75,000 wonderful experts on Montessori in North America alone. And there are many friends of Montessori, people that never became officially Montessori credentialed, who are profoundly influenced and follow in the footsteps. So what I wanted to share with you tonight in part is this vision of what Montessori is and what Montessori is not. What it is is an attempt to create a science of education, to understand what's true as opposed to what is prejudice. What is prejudice are the founding principles that led to the American and Canadian public school system. And the same is true of the British, the French, the German, the Spanish, all over the world. The modern concept of school was created during the 1800s by the belief that the cream rises to the top. That human beings' intelligence is hardwired at conception and that good breeding produces superior intelligence. I'd like to suggest to you that that's not quite true. And we know this for a fact. What we know is that genetics is important. It's very important. Genes influence not only the color of our hair and our tendency to put on muscle and how high we will grow and the way our face looks, but it influences all sorts of things. The way we talk, the gestures, many of our interests, the way we respond to stress, many, many things are inherited from our parents and their parents going back who knows how many generations. And every time a womb is the home of a sperm and an egg and a new human being is created, we have a genetic inheritance being passed down to the earliest human being. So to suggest that there is nothing that's genetic that makes you and me who we are, that's ridiculous. But we know that humans are not simply that. They are also the result of their biological experience. A baby with the capacity to genius, which by the way I would suggest most babies have, who is fed lead by eating, let's say, flaking lead paint, will lose that capacity. The biology of the organism will be changed. A malnourished child, a child who is hit by accident by a falling brick and suffers brain damage. I assure you, you can affect the human body in all sorts of ways, from chemicals like drugs and alcohol, especially in utero, from malnutrition, from smoking, all sorts of disease and injury affect who we are. You take a major exam when you're exhausted or you have the flu, you're not going to do the same as you would have if your body wasn't going through that. So everyone agree with me? Biology is very important. Not only at the moment, if you were half asleep, you wouldn't be able to attend as well as you can being as bright and chipper as you are. But if you were starving, or if you were suffering with Ebola, or you had a splitting headache, your capacity to learn at that moment, and in the case of major trauma or chronic changes to the body, you'd be affected in the long term. So you agree, genetics are part, biology is part, and then there's experience. What that baby experiences in this moment is being recorded forever. Not at a conscious level but at a level that is deep into the soul. And if, as Maria said, Maria Montessori said, you give a young brain pablum, nonsense, ridiculous stuff like we tend to give them, the toys we buy, the stuff that they experience, the baby talk, the boredom that most children experience, 
and the brain will not fulfill its potential. Montessori builds better brains. By the way, so do a lot of things. You go to a Jesuit school, and you can have an incredible education. You can go to a Jewish school, and you can have an incredible education. You go to the public school, and have an incredible education. But normally, it will be a bell curve distribution. Unless they handpick and only take the best of the best of the best, as you see in many countries around the world and as we see in certain universities, unless we stack the deck, you will see a bell curve distribution. What I ask you for the moment to believe is that you can move the midpoint towards the high end. Humans are different. Humans are different. You take a thousand human beings, they're different. They don't learn in the same way. They don't learn in the same time. They don't learn in the same pace. Each one of us, regardless of where we grow up, is our own universe of one. We are our own person. Montessori schools are different. <clears throat> in part, because they're not designed like a factory. They're not designed to try to stop the foreignness out of you. Most of our schools were designed in North America because of the desire to get children out of the workforce and to stop out the fear of socialism taking over our country. The schools were founded at a time in the late 1800s and early 1900s by people who were experts in factories, who were fascinated by the Industrial Revolution, and who believed that the world's problems could be solved by industrial efficiency. And you can understand why. Before there was standardization, Every mechanical part had to be handmade. It was far less efficient, far more expensive. It took far longer to make a chair. Today, in a factory, you can whip those things out many a minute. We were, at that time, fascinated with the idea of standardization. And we created, out of that model, the idea of textbooks and state curricula, and plans of what shall be taught at what time to all children of a certain age level, and the belief of failure. Canada's heritage is not the schools that you find in your province today. Your heritage is the prairie school, the multi-age rural school, continuous progress learning. What I ask you to remember is the days when 40 children in the classroom were the norm and there was still order. It could be that you went to a school taught by nuns. It could be that you went to school in India or China or Japan and you had classes of 40, 50, or 60. And they were quiet and they were orderly and real learning occurred. Today, our imagination is that the smaller and smaller the ratio of children to adults, the better the learning will become. There's no evidence to support that. There's a lot of political pressure to do it because the smaller the number of children per adult, the easier the job is for the teacher, the fewer papers she has to grade, the more jobs are created, the more things are sold to each individual teacher by companies that are selling to schools. That's big business. Companies like Longman Pearson are major international corporate giants. And they're selling stuff from computers to smart boards 
to schools all over the world that believe if you throw an iPad at a child, they will learn. We suggest that the brain is and always was created by the hand. That children learn by doing. That children learn in their own pace, in their own time. And that adults forget what it's like to be a child. We forget what it was like when we didn't know how to read. We forget when they're lagging there and you're trying to get to work and they're sort of dawdling and looking at a flower. We forget they're not on our time schedule. They're not living in our world. But the purpose of being a father, the purpose of being a mother, is to take these children that we've conceived and to raise them up free of harm to be our equal, to join us in the circle of the adult community, whether you live in India, Korea, France, Spain, Argentina, the whole purpose of being a parent is to raise the next generation. The purpose of the school is to help parents raise children. Raising children is not just teaching them skills. We have confused skills with what it takes to survive in our society. There are lots of reasons for that. One of them is, if we make you get a degree, before you can enter the profession, we can limit access to the profession. In most of the world, the way you learn how to hammer iron, or farm, or make clothing, or become a chef, was apprenticeship. You learn by doing. You learn by doing the real thing with people who really knew what they were doing. We have separated children so horribly from the adult world that the best we typically do is send them out on youth mission work. Not bad, but not the same as doing that and teaching them how to really do things that bring them into the adult world. That teach them the dignity of work. That teach them they can solve problems and cherish them as individuals for their strengths, not poking at their weaknesses. Every child is different. Every adult is different. The idea of Montessori is create a science of education that is not based on prejudice. 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 All people of color, they smell bad. All people of color, they're not as bright as people of European heritage. Now, it could just as easily be Asians saying, all people of European culture, they're not as good as us. That belief that little girls are not as capable as, as men, that the children of the poor are not going to go as far in the world as the children of the wealthy. It's not that there's no truth in it. Males will tend to put on more muscle mass. You can go out and play rugby. I'm not sure the woman beside you is ready to do that. <laughs> there is a difference. On the other hand, I know some women that could take you right down. <laughs> so it isn't gender. It's that we're different. And we respect in Montessori the idea that every child is different. We respect that we're not just teaching content, but rather human beings. We're teaching people, and we're bringing them into our world, into our world. And they learn best by doing, and they learn best from each other, not from some adult. And they learn best by repetition. Not in the sense of mindless drill, but by making mistakes. Lots of mistakes. 
and learning how to do it correctly. And they learn, just as they do in Japan, just as they do in China, just as they do in India, just as they do all over the world, by practice, by work. It takes work. But work, work is what defines us. Work is not something to be dreaded. It is why you get up in the morning. Whether your work is to raise a really nice kid, or to grow your garden, or to make furniture, or to lead a team in your industry, or to keep accounts. Work is something that has dignity. Work is what adults do. The idea is to bring kids to a place where they are honored for who they are, where their personality, their emotional life, their spiritual life, and by that I don't mean train them to be good Christians, Jews, Muslims, or anything else. I mean that sense of belonging in this world. That sense of living without shame. That sense of believing that you belong on this planet. And having a sense of balance and understanding that we are not the centers of the universe, that life is not always fair, that things are not always easy, and that sweat is part of what we do. That idea of helping each other, of learning to be in partnership, understanding that we are not always the boss, the leader, but that we always have dignity. And that we have to treat others with respect. We need to be treated with respect. That is profoundly different than the way most schools work. The way most schools work is you learn to line up you learn to keep your mouth shut. You learn to sit still. You learn to give the right answer. And you learn to get your homework done on time. You learn to turn off your brain and turn on your memorization. Now, not all schools are like that. As brain science has become more and more understood, more and more educators all over the world have gotten it. The old ways are not the correct ways. And the beauty of Montessori is 108 years ago, that woman began a worldwide movement that led us to what we're now discovering. That the way the brain really works is the way schools need to become. And that is the way the Montessori movement is done. Now, this is not the biggest school in Saskatoon. This is not the wealthiest school in Saskatoon. It's not, the, it's not the only Montessori school in your community. Nor are we here to say that other schools have no value. Many times people have the impression that Montessorians know it all and think everyone else knows nothing. It's not it. What is it is we basically argue, stop fighting human nature. Asking kids to sit down and be quiet makes no sense if the goal is to teach them how to join the adult community. The correct way to do it is to teach them to get up, get off their belts, hunch their shoulders, stiffen their backs, and put themselves to hard work and learn like the rest of us do in this world. By making mistakes, by watching each other, by learning from others, by asking questions, by trial and error. People make mistakes all the time, which doesn't mean that we should do sloppy work. But rather that we just need to be realistic. Especially when we're learning to play the violin, it often sounds like a cat is squawking. Someone stepped on the cat's tail. As you learn to play the violin, you make mistakes. If you keep at it, 
And you have any talent, you'll at least learn how to come up with a decent tune. You may not go to Carnegie Hall. There are differences in humans. What we're suggesting then is all of us have our own voice. And that you can design schools where kids really want to go to school. Where kids grow up differently. And so now I want to speak for a few more minutes about difference. Here's what's different. Montessori kids, like kids elsewhere, they learn chemistry. Some of them become politicians, some of them become business people. Well, that's the most common thing you see in children who grow up in schools like this. They will become the founders of businesses. And they tend to be really nice people to work for because they don't tend to stab you in the back. They usually grow up with good values. They tend to appreciate the idea of long-term relationships, of having word that can be trusted. They will usually grow up with a strong sense of wanting to make things right if they have offended or if they have let someone down. They tend to make really nice friends. They tend to work well on teams. They tend to be the kind of people you can lend money to and trust. Basically, I'm trying to suggest to you that what the research is showing, as well as all of us who have raised Montessori kids, been Montessori kids, or done studies on Montessori kids, is they tend to have an uncanny level of what Angela Duckworth down at the University of Pennsylvania calls executive functioning skills. Executive functioning skills are a fancy way of saying common sense. The ability to stick to it and follow through even when your buddies want you to go out and have pizza. The ability to resist the temptation to just put it down and go watch the TV. Not mom nagging you, but rather the kind of self-drive that allows you to go off to university where there is no mother and father to nag you and do the right thing without essentially having inner demons. And I say that because many of us grow up with kind of our mother and our grandmother's voice going off inside of our head telling us, you will let the family down if you don't do X, Y, Z. Many people live lives of rage, quiet frustration, because they never, never, never were allowed in their heart to find their own voice, to make their own choices. They were programmed to do what the family thought they should do. Others learned early on, whatever their parents want, we're going to do the exact opposite. And that's just as much a puppet as the one that obeys. What I'm talking about is the kind of maturity that leads to a balanced, psychologically healthy adult. Now, Montessori is a name. Anybody can open a school and call it Montessori. Millions of kids around the world go to Montessori schools. Literally, millions and millions and millions of kids. The largest school in the world is the City Montessori School of Lucknow, India. Last time I looked, they had 36,000 children under one administration. By the way, look them up, cms.org. We are not talking about grass huts. If any of you come from <laughs> India, if any of you know Lucknow, it's the Silicon Valley of India. Now, it's not that I'm suggesting these schools look like American schools. They look like American universities. Big campuses, beautiful facilities, international faculties, and they don't serve the international population. They are for local Indian students. They keep the tuition dirt cheap. Now, in India, I don't care 
what it costs, there are some people who can't afford it. But as much as you can, being a non-government school, this family, the Gandhis, have figured out how to run a school that is world-class, Montessori, and goes all the way up through high school and a four-year college. Montessori is not simply preschool, but it always begins with preschool. The reason why? The same reason why you might, if you decided to adopt a child, like to get them the day they're born. It's not that you can't help a child who's 10 and give them a home and take them in and help them. But you are fighting whatever happened to them in those first 10 years. And it isn't just 10 years. It's the years in which their, their minds, their personality was like wet clay, easily shaped. But as we age, clay hardens. As we get to about four, our personality is pretty much fixed. Not that part of it wasn't genetic from the first place. But by the time we're 12, we are heavily programmed by our family, our friends, the media, and the schools that we've attended. It's almost impossible to make major change. Take psychotherapy, religious transformation. It is not easy. It happens rarely. Just try to lose weight. Try to stop smoking. You'll know what I mean. But when a child is a little one, they're fresh and alive and they're vibrant. And a school or a parent or a grandparent can do so much to shape them, not only in terms of kindness, but of creating in them an intellectual thirst for knowledge a ability to work methodically, to be present in the moment, to follow through, to learn how to learn. So what is Montessori? Montessori is lots of things. Montessori is like the elephant and the five blind men that the Buddha talked about 2,500 years ago. You touch a different part of it, you get a different impression. There's a lot to Montessori. It's a philosophy of life that is based on the idea that life is worth celebrating. It's a philosophy of life that says human beings are capable of amazing things. It's a philosophy of life that says there is evil. There is evil in this world. There are evil people who will do things to hurt you. Don't simply assume they're all nice. They're not all nice. Capable of amazing things and capable of great evil. And here's how to tell the difference. Here's how to build around you a network of people with whom you can really work. Here's how to protect yourself from harm without living in fear and anger and resentment. It's a philosophy of life that tends to create in kids a sense of, of wonder, a sense of being connected to all of humanity, a sense of compassion, empathy, a thirst to understand, a resistance to prejudice, and an openness to new experience, learning how to learn. And it's a school that is designed for differences. I can't emphasize how basic that principle is. We are so accustomed in this world the idea that a student enters a course that begins on day one, there is a fixed syllabus, and on day 10 they'll be at a specific place, and you're either with the group or top luck and will grade you by how well you do, and you must complete it by the last day of the semester. Our belief is that learning works that way. It works that way if you make it work that way. You can create a self-fulfilling prophecy. McGill University used to drag its doctors through 
bloody heck. Exhausting them, putting them through 30 hour days, making them be afraid every year that they were going to be cut because they're always cutting. There's no need to do that. And years ago, McGill's medical faculty came to the American Monastery Society and asked us to help them to think what would Maria Montessori do? We came up with a very different way of educating doctors. And medicine has begun to shift to a different culture where you get hands-on experience dealing with trauma as a sort of a paramedic early on in your medical career instead of at the end. And where you can sleep at night and you're not living in the <coughs> but where the best schools in the world say, you're good enough to get in We'll drag you through this degree. You've got to work hard to get kicked out. Do you see the difference in philosophy of support and honor and respect versus intimidation, bribery, and fear? Design for difference celebrates you as an individual without suggesting anything you do is just fine. We want you to rise up to become great. We know that you won't be the same as the person next to you. You'll all be different. The goal, and I heard you say this, doctor, earlier today, the goal is that every child sweats, works hard, lives up to their potential, goes beyond what they would normally do, but not through bribery nor through intimidation but by instilling in the child a thirst and a love for learning and a belief that they are worth having as friends, that they belong in this world, that they're honored. This is a child honor school. It's been my pleasure to spend two days here. I look forward to three more. This is one of those schools that has the potential to go far beyond what has been begun in the early years. The reason why the board and administration asked me to come was one, to celebrate the hiring of you. But also to help all of you begin to envision a future. And so I will propose a future. Five, ten years off, Ten years would be the most it should take. You have a home of your own. You have a home that looks beautiful. It doesn't look like you're in someone else's building. That's designed for your programs. In every classroom, this may not seem important to you as parents, but in every classroom, there's a kitchen. These kids learn to cook. And they cook constantly. That's the most basic, practical life. Feed yourself, clean up, grow food, know how to do the stuff of real life. Understand the chemistry of washing clothes. Understand what it means to sanitize something. Understand how to fix, how to do first aids, is what I really meant to say. <coughs> Notice, we want these kids to be like the scout. Be prepared. Here in your province, your children are taught to go outside in all kinds of weather. They're taught how to orient themselves in the prairie, in the forest. They're taught things that in the cities children often don't learn. That's kind of what Montessori is all about. It's really more like the scouts than anything else. It's independence. It's self-reliance. It's the ability to work as part of a team, and it's a culture that says, we're in it together. We help each other. There are no second-class citizens. I am asking you to imagine a future where your school is about two to three times larger than it is now. I'm going to suggest three. It's about 350, 400 students through 12th grade. International Baccalaureate Diploma Program in the last two years. So you have a Montessori education with the International Baccalaureate giving your graduates 
the ability to choose pretty much any college they want to go to in the world. And the school where your kids are not having sleepless nights before exams or fearful that they're not good enough. Where they are literally learning how to passionately love science or math or philosophy or history or the act of writing. And where you increasingly see in your children and your grandchildren children in whom you take great pride, not just love, but you're proud to be part of that community. I had the good fortune to grow up in a school of 650 students in Washington, D.C. I had the good fortune to be a Montessori child from age 1 through the 12th grade. I chose the most non-Montessori college I could find, Georgetown University. For a Jewish boy in 1963, that was pretty non-Montessori. <laughs> and it was the first time I had ever heard people speak to me with such disrespect. Montessori children do well in the world. They don't necessarily like the way the world treats them. But they know how to charm professors. <laughs> and they know how to stand their ground and speak their truth. Excuse me, sir, why are you treating me with this kind of disrespect? Why have I done to offend you? I mention no harm. They understand the idea of giving your word and of standing your ground. Speaking your truth. And as the Quakers would say, living your life speak. In conclusion, what I mean by that, Anne Frank is the world poster child of Montessori. I don't know if you know that. There are many people in whom we take great pride and we put on spotlights and we talk about people like Julia Child, who was a Montessori kid, and we talk about Jacqueline Kennedy, who was a Montessori kid. We talk about Princess Diana, who was a Montessori kid and a Montessori teacher. We talk a lot about the Google guys. Everyone seems to know the Google guys in the Montessori kid. But for me, the one that matters most, that is the most exemplary of everything we do around the world, for me it's Anne Frank. Anne Frank, little Dutch girl, 12 years old when she had to go into hiding, was a student in Montessori from the age of three until the Germans said no Jews will go to school with Christmas. Her family was one of the founding families of the very first Montessori high school, Lyceum Montessori Voromstadt. That school today has about 8,000 students in it. It's the oldest Montessori high school. The one I graduated from is the oldest in North America. Anne Frank's great gift is not that she hid in a, in a little attic. Her gift is her diary. And the gift of that diary is the glimpse into a human soul under intolerable conditions. And her sense of the possibility of dignity in this world, of a world in which something like the horror that she was seeing unfold in the streets before her would never happen again. It's that hope for a better tomorrow. My wife asked me not that long ago, on a long drive, why the heck do we do this? And without thinking, I said, to save the world. And she said, I knew you'd say that, but tell me in your own words for the record, Mr. Selden, <laughs> why would you say that? And I said, well, to me it's obvious. Humanity has, for now, ever since the American Civil War, been on a fast track to extinction. Once we began to understand how to harness industrial technology to the construction of means of killing. 
it was inevitable that we will sooner or later create the equivalent of Darth Vader's Death Star. We are becoming more and more and more efficient at destroying human life. We are also more and more vulnerable. We're more vulnerable to climate change. We're more vulnerable to ecological collapse. We're more vulnerable to all the various conditions from what is currently affecting the beehives of North America to the threat of Ebola or other viruses that could go sweeping through the world's population. To me, it is obvious. Either human beings learn to live together in peace, despite our differences. Either we learn how to teach children how to be peacemakers, or we are done for. And that's my answer as to why I'm a Montessori. That's the reason why Maria Montessori gave up being an independently wealthy professor and practitioner of medicine. She never planned for it. it was, she never wanted to work with children, never wanted to have children. But when she did her work and she saw the transformation of these little babies into the kinds of kids they became, and she saw it happen all over the world on every major continent except Antarctica. She began to realize she had stumbled on something she never predicted. The capacity of human beings for goodness. You don't know what you're into. You just don't. As parents, even probably as teachers, you don't know how important this really is. All I can tell you is the younger children are when they enter a school like this, or any of the other Montessori schools, of your province or of your country. And the longer they stay, the more profoundly it will affect them for the rest of their lives. I cannot guarantee that they will become doctors or millionaires. I cannot predict who they will be. I can only predict they will probably become incredible human beings. The kind of person that you want as a friend, the kind of person you hope that your daughter will marry, the kind of person you hope your daughter would be. In Yiddish, we would say, we will raise a mensch, real human being, good person. That's a monster result.